a 16 year old girl would go Christmas shopping with her best friend. But unfortunately, she never returned home. But before we get started, welcome to True Crime with Man Eater. If you love all things true crime, including missing person cases, cold cases, and just the strange happenings of the world, you've come to the right place. Be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. Let's get started. Leanne Tiernan was born on September 27, 1984, in Leeds, England. She was the daughter of Sharon and Michael Tiernan, and Leanne's parents were divorced, but she lived with her mother and older sister, Michelle. Leanne was described as a tidy young woman who loved to have a clean bedroom. She was described as incredibly thoughtful and loyal. She would stress if she didn't have enough money to buy her friends or family members a birthday card or Christmas card or something along those lines. She wanted everybody to feel special and loved. Leanne's grandmother would say that Leanne was an incredibly careful young woman and that as she grew into a teenager, she just became this lovely young woman. She was fun and warm and outgoing and genuinely loved to be around her family. Even as she was getting older, she wasn't one of those teenagers that wanted to be away from her family. In fact, she was quite the opposite. She just grew closer to them. She just had a way with people. People loved her. They looked up to her. They thought she was just that sweet, loyal, kind. She was incredible in every way. She was attending West Leeds High School and at the time had a 19-year-old boyfriend. One of her uncles even nicknamed her Chocolate Chip Niece because she loved chocolate immensely. On November 26, 2000, 16-year-old Leanne left her home to do some Christmas shopping with a friend. She would spend the day with her best friend, who was 15 at the time, Sarah Whitehouse. At around 4.50 p.m., the girls jumped on the bus. They would walk a short way together before splitting up to head to their individual homes. The girls would split up at Hoffley Lane and go their separate ways. They didn't live that far apart from each other. And Sarah would look back and she watched her best friend walk down the unlit path home. After Sarah arrived home, she would call her best friend's house, Leanne's home, and she got some surprising news. Leanne hadn't made it home yet. Sarah knew that something was wrong. It wasn't a long walk back home. In fact, it was quite a short walk and she should have arrived at the same time almost as Sarah arrived home. So Sarah is talking to Sharon and she says, you know, something's wrong. This is the time we left. We should both be home by now. Sharon immediately starts to call her daughter's phone. Sharon calls Leanne's phone at around 5.20 p.m. and although it rings, nobody picks up. So she would try to call again, and this time the phone rang four times before somebody cut it off. Instantly, Sharon knew that something was wrong. Her daughter would never ignore her phone calls. Leanne was incredibly responsible. It was very much unlike her to go somewhere without letting her mother know. She was an extremely happy and confident young woman, and there was no way that she would run away from home. And there was no real issues in the household which would explain why she would want to run away. This was just completely unlike her. Obviously fearing for her daughter's safety, Sharon calls the police at around 7 p.m. that night. Police would take this incredibly serious. They jumped in and began searching the last place where Leanne was seen, but they continued to come up empty. As the police inquiry progressed, it became one of the largest ever undertaken by West Yorkshire Police, and it involved up to 200 police officers and hundreds of volunteers. During this time, more than 1,400 house-to-house -house inquiries were conducted, and 800 houses along her probable route, designated by police as the Red Route, were searched, along with 800 sheds, garages, outbuildings, and 150 commercial premises within a half-mile radius of where she was last seen. DNA samples were taken from 140 men interviewed by the police in connection with this inquiry, and 12 search warrants were executed at various addresses and leads. Police would also have an underwater team come in and search a three-mile section of the Leeds and Liverpool Canal, and two miles of that was drained to a depth of one meter. They also searched 32 drain shafts in the area, and they checked abandoned drains and wells. I'm actually quite shocked at how thorough police were with this investigation right off from the bat. That doesn't always happen. Police would even halt garbage collection to allow them to search for bins for any evidence of this girl. I mean, that's a pretty thorough job. It wasn't just the local police working on this investigation. They had a lot of help. 
This help included British Waterways, British Transport Police, the Ministry of Defense's Aerial Department, Calder Valley Search and Rescue Team, Interpool, the Police National Search Center, which was a joint police and military training facility. Unfortunately, they still weren't finding any evidence. This is an incredibly large search, and it's only a short span where this girl could have gone missing from. It was probably a five-minute walk home from where she was last seen. And she goes down this unlit path, and then she's never seen again. There's no clues. There's no leads. Police really don't have anything to go on. But they have a lot of people helping, and they're taking all the right steps. On December 3rd, 2000, police decide to film a reconstruction of the girl's last movements. They asked Sarah Whitehouse, who was with Leanne that day, and Leanne's older sister, Michelle, to take part in the reconstruction video. Detectives would even take to texting Leanne's phone, which had been shut off by this point. But they did learn that it was shortly activated on November 27th, 2000, which was incredibly confusing. I'm sure at this point they were wondering if Leanne was alive and maybe she went missing on purpose. Maybe she ran away. Maybe she didn't want to be home anymore. So again, they're still hoping that she's alive by this point. A local businessman would actually offer a $10,000 reward for any information leading to Leanne's safe return. And then a supermarket chain in Iceland would actually print her photo and details on a milk carton, and that sold in stores nationwide. There were unconfirmed sightings of her, but after nine months, there had been no positive sightings. Leanne's boyfriend, who was 19 at the time and a care assistant, pleaded for her safe return. On December 4, 2000, police would release a sketch of a man walking his dog on that same road that Leanne had taken. This man was described as being 5 foot 8 inches with a stocky build, a round reddish face that might possibly be scarred, he was wearing a black woolen hat, a three quarters length waterproof jacket, and dirty jeans. Unfortunately, in late August of 2001, a man walking his two dogs in Lidley Woods, North Yorkshire, would find Leanne's body. Leanne's body was found about a hundred yards from where another murder victim, Yvonne Fitt, had been discovered buried in 1992. Leanne was identified by her fingerprints. Leanne Tiernan's body had been wrapped inside nine green plastic garbage bags secured with twine with a black bin bag secured around her head with a leather dog collar. She was then placed inside a floral pattern duvet cover. Leanne's coat and boots were not discovered at the body dump site. Her cell phone, umbrella, keys, and Christmas presents she bought during her shopping trip were all missing. Plastic cable ties had been used as a ligature to strangle her, and there were more ties used to bind her hands. A dark colored scarf was also wrapped around her neck. Her hair was still tied in a ponytail with the same band and hair clips that she had been seen wearing the day she disappeared. Forensic experts would come across a startling conclusion. They believe that after Leanne's death, she was kept in cold storage or a freezer. A cryobiology expert was called in to examine Leanne's cardiac tissue and concluded the body could have been kept frozen for some time, taking into account the air temperatures from the months between her disappearance and the discovery of the body. Upon hearing the news, police instantly took to the public and asked them for any information they had regarding Leanne's murder. After Leanne's body had been found, police went and took DNA from 200 more people. People that knew Leanne, friends, families, strangers, anybody they could connect to her life, they took DNA samples from. They also found known sex offenders in the area and took their DNA as well. And luckily, police were able to find a match. This forensic evidence led to a man known as John Taylor, and this man lived 1,300 yards away from Leanne's home. John Taylor was born on August 27, 1956 in Leeds. He had been a parsley delivery worker and enjoyed hunting from an early age. Police would soon learn that this man would take pleasure in harming animals. He would catch and torture rabbits, he had been seen stabbing a fox repeatedly while he was out poaching, and he also enjoyed clubbing peasants to death. And although he had some turbulent personal relationships, he did have two children. John did live in the same housing estate as Leanne, and was known by neighbors as the pet man. And this was because he had a number of animals, dogs, ferrets, and was known to sell pet food. But people also knew him as a local poacher. John Taylor only had one previous conviction, and that was at the age of 15. He got caught stealing a suit. Neighbors considered him to be very trustworthy and, quite frankly, ordinary. And earlier I mentioned that after Leanne's body was found, 
police came forward and asked for any information that the public had. Two of John Taylor's ex-girlfriends did come forward and what they had to tell police startled them. Police would discover that John Taylor was a frequent user of Lonely Hearts advertisements. Through his phone records, they were able to identify some women and interview them. One woman that dated John Taylor said that he liked tying women up and locking them in the cupboard. Another woman said that John Taylor had a fetish for bondage, whips, and ties. She also said that John Taylor wanted to tie up her 15-year-old daughter with cable ties and have sexual intercourse with her. A former girlfriend who briefly dated John told police that they often visited Lidley Woods, and that's where Leanne was found, while they were dating, and that she eventually broke off their relationship with him because of his bondage fetish and the feeling that she was being raped. Police would ask her how John Taylor tied her up, and she described his practice of securing a plastic cable tie around each of her wrists, then tying her hands behind her back by using a third cable to link them. That was exactly how Leanne's body had been found. She also said that those ties were kept in a drawer next to John Taylor's bed. During a search of John Taylor's house, police would recover quite a bit of evidence. The police would find twine in his house. Upon examining this twine, they realized that it was quite unique. This twine was usually only used by the military of defense. There had, however, been a small amount of twine sold to the public for rabbit catch nets. The twine collected from Leanne's remains were an exact match to the batch, as well as a match to twine found in Taylor's house. The yellow cable ties were manufactured by an Italian company, and those yellow cable ties had been sold to the parcel delivery services, where John worked. Those cable ties were found in John's home as well. They also found red fibers on Leanne, and as they're searching John's home, they notice all the carpets had been pulled up and burned. Luckily, forensic experts were able to find some of those fibers still on the floor. They had gotten caught in nails, so they could remove those fibers and match them to those found on Leanne. This meant that police could now prove that Leanne had been in this man's home prior to her death. Interestingly enough, there was a pollen found in Leanne's hair and nostrils and on her skin. And this was a really distinct type of pollen, and police were able to locate it in John Taylor's garden, which was obviously further proof that Leanne had been in his home. I remember there was a sketch done of a man walking his dog. That man was walking his dog in the woods where Leanne was found. And as police are searching this home, they find a dead dog. The DCI on the case would say, the dog that he was walking that day was a terrier dog, which we found in the back garden with two other dogs buried. That terrier dog had had its head stoved in with a meat cleaver because we had put an appeal in the paper with a photo fit of the man asking if anyone knew him. So he got rid of the dog. That should tell you just how deranged this man is. I mean, it's known that he's a local poacher and that he harms animals, but to not get caught, he beat his own dog to death. I can't imagine what Leanne went through. On October 16, 2001, John Taylor was arrested for the murder of Leanne. As he's being interviewed by police, John Taylor would admit to kidnapping Leanne. He basically told police that he hadn't been on that lane for years, but on the day that Leanne went missing, he had been in the area. He said that she had walked past him and Taylor had impulsively reached out and grabbed her arm. Police would ask him why he decided to abduct the team, and he told them that he really had no idea as to why. But he did say that he tied her hands with a dog leash, threw his jacket over her head, and forced her to walk to his home. Although John Taylor would admit to kidnapping the teen, he would say that her death was an accident. He said that once he got her inside the house, he forced the young girl into his bedroom and made her get into bed. He said that she would put up a fight, and at one point, ended up falling off the bed where she hit her head on the floor. He would then tell police that he picked her up by her scarf wrapped around her neck and that she died. John Taylor would say that he basically panicked and then went and buried her body in the woods. But authorities believe otherwise. They believe that John Taylor tied her hands behind her back with the cable ties because he planned to sexually assault her. The police would then theorize that the blindfold slipped during a struggle and Leanne saw her attacker. And that's when John decided that he had to kill her. So he would use the cable tie as a ligature. So John did claim that he just took her body to the woods and buried it, but police didn't believe so. So police kept asking him about this. And finally, John Taylor told them that he buried her body in the garden under some pallets. He then said he later moved the body and put it inside his couch. 
Again, this man is just completely deranged. He lived with this little girl in his garden and then supposedly put her in his couch. I'm not sure if I believe that because the evidence points to the fact that he probably put her in the freezer. It's just disgusting and disturbing. I do feel like he did that not only to just not get caught, but because he wanted a reminder of her. He wanted to look at her and be able to see her and know what he did. It's like he was reliving it. On February 15, 2002, he would plead guilty to kidnapping the girl, but he would not plead guilty to murdering her. On July 8, 2002, his trial would begin. He would then plead guilty for the murder of Leanne and was sentenced on the same day. The justice would say, not by chance were you in this area for this purpose. You were not acting on impulse. You chose a secluded place and brought a young girl who suited your purposes. This was as cold and calculating as can be imagined. You are a dangerous sexual sadist. Your purpose in kidnapping this young girl was so that you could satisfy your perverted cravings. The suffering you caused her and the suffering you continue to cause those who loved her simply cannot be measured. You must expect to spend the rest of your life in custody. Taylor's sentence was changed from life imprisonment to a minimum of 12 years. From my understanding, this does not mean he'll get out in 12 years, that he'll still serve life behind bars. But this was changed by Lord Wolf, who had been at the time Lord Chief Justice of England and Wales. So because of this, Taylor was not considered one of the prisoners who'd been given a whole life tariff, and those prisoners were given life imprisonments without the chance of parole or condition release. Prisoners spend the rest of their lives behind bars unless given compassionate release or pardoned. So I assume that means he will spend the rest of his life behind bars unless he is pardoned or given compassionate release. At the end of his trial, the detective working the case would go on to say, We do not believe that this is the first major crime he committed. We feel that the way his murder was pre-planned and the way he hid and disposed of the body was calculated. We cannot exclude the possibility that he has killed before. There were two rapes that police were incredibly interested in because they happen in the same housing estate that John Taylor was living in. In 1988, a woman was walking on that same place that Leanne was last seen, and she was attacked by a masked man with a knife. She was then raped, but he let her go. On March 1st, 1989, a 21-year-old woman had been home with her children when a masked man broke into her home, forced her in her bedroom, where he gagged, blindfolded, and raped her. John Taylor was arrested for these two rapes in 2002, and they were able to use DNA to connect him to those rapes. On February 4, 2003, he did plead guilty to those two rapes. After pleading guilty, he received two life terms in prison. After this, the detective went on to say, We are still concerned that there may be other victims and families who have been affected by Taylor's actions. He did mention that in John Taylor's 2001 arrest, they discovered a necklace in his car, which they believe to belong to an unknown victim. They still haven't been able to determine where it came from or who it belonged to. Because Taylor often traveled around the country to deliver packages and he responds to personal ads, they do believe there's a chance that he had many other victims in the country and it wasn't just local crimes. They didn't believe that John Taylor just grabbed this girl as she was walking simply because it was impulsive. They believe he planned this, and they believe that he had been a serial sex attacker for at least 20 years. So I mentioned earlier there was some confusion about his sentencing, but one of the justices came forward and said, I am anxious that this sentence is not misunderstood or misreported. The sentence is and remains a sentence of imprisonment for life. The defendant may not even be considered for release for this offense or murder until he has served at least 30 years. This is not to say that he will then be released, for the whole life term imposed for the rapes remain in force. Furthermore, the defendant will be detained unless, until the parole board is satisfied that he no longer presents a risk to the public. Many prisoners, and surely John Taylor is likely to be one, and in fact detained for many years after their tariff has expired. Indeed, it may be that he presents such a risk that he could never safely be released, but this is for others to decide in due course. I am just anxious that no one thinks that I am suggesting that he be released in 30 years, for I most certainly am not. So due to those two rapes, Taylor was given a sentence of life imprisonment with a recommendation of a minimum of 30 years. I did mention that Leanne's body was found where another woman had been previously found. The last official sighting of Yvonne Fitt was on January 16, 1992. Yvonne was 32 years old and the mother of an 11-year-old girl at the time of her death. She had been working as a sex worker in the red light districts of both Bradford and Leeds. Unfortunately, she had been dealing with a drug addiction. 
She was last seen at the Bradford DSS office where she was signing up for benefits. Eight months later, she was found in a shallow grave decomposing, and that shallow grave was right next to where Leanne would be found years later. Detectives were able to establish that she had been stabbed to death and had been taken to the rural location from either Leeds or Bradford. They didn't know if she was taken there alive or not. So years later, Leanne's body was found 100 yards from where Yvonne Fitt had been buried and found. It was known that John frequented and used the Lonely Hearts advertisements. I question if he had found Yvonne Fitt on there or something and obviously called her and decided to meet up with her. He could have very well been using an escort service, and this is where he found Yvonne Fitt. Police are also looking into another case about a woman named Deborah Wood. 20-year-old Deborah Wood was last seen alive on January 4th, 1996, after leaving Big Lil's public house at around 5 p.m., where she had met her father for some drinks. Unfortunately, I couldn't uncover much about Deborah's personal life, but I did know that she was a factory worker. The body of Deborah Wood was discovered on January 4th, 1996 at Burley Railway Station in Leeds. Her body was discovered 10 days later when she was last seen by firefighters after a report of a fire. It seems that Deborah had been doused in gas and lit on fire. Much like Leanne, they believe Deborah had been stored in a freezer. She had been wrapped in bedding and garbage bags, just like Leanne had been. Apparently, Deborah's body was found a short walk away from John Taylor's home. Deborah's mother, who was 74 at the time of the interview, would say that she wanted to visit John Taylor in prison. She would say, I want him to put me out of my misery before I go. I'm sure it was him. When I saw his eyes, they sent chills through me. I want to see him face to face and just ask him, tell me the truth. This has been 23 years of hurt. I can't describe the pain. I do believe that police are correct. I don't think this was a one-time unplanned murder of a 16-year-old girl. I firmly believe that he probably killed Yvonne Fitt and Deborah Wood. I'm hopeful that both cases will come to a close that eventually he will either confess or police have enough evidence to convict him. But that's it for today, guys. If you like this video or any other video on my channel, be sure to subscribe and turn on alerts so you never miss a video upload. If there's a case you'd like me to cover, pop in the comments below and I'll be sure to get to it. In the meantime, check out some other videos on my channel while you wait for the next upload, and I'll see you then.